Bill's representing a work tonight that was founded in 1976, and it's called Bridges for Peace. And it is a ministry of uh, hope and reconciliation. And what it is, in, in fact, and practice, is Christians supporting Israel and building relationships between Christians and Jews, not only in Israel, but around the world. Speaker tonight, Dr. Bill Adams. He's National Field Director with Bridges for Peace. He has postgraduate degrees in divinity, Judeo-Christian synergism. He holds a Doctor of Divinity from Masters International University of Divinity. The best news comes now, Bill. He's married to Lizzie. He's got seven children and nine, soon to be, how many grandchildren? Well, eight and nine are on the way. And the family live in Florida, the Sunshine State. Come on up, Bill, and uh, do your stuff. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Stewart. And good evening, everybody. Thanks for your warm welcome. It really has been a warm welcome. A nice uh, soup and salad with, with Pastor Stewart earlier. And we're all ready. Uh, what time is everybody ready to go tonight? I want to make sure I don't get so carried away. Okay, um, 7 o'clock. Excellent. That's coming soon. That's good. <laughs> I want to prioritize the Word of God, so go to Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, and I want to share a bit about the first commandment. Did you just preach on this last Sunday, and, uh, and now it's old news? I don't think it could ever be really old news. The, the first commandment, uh, or maybe otherwise known as the most important commandment. And you know, sometimes I can be insecure. I can be insecure a lot. Anybody join me? Getting in front of people, speaking. All right, sure. And in fact, I can be insecure about my topic. I might think, oh, I'm not sure if what I'm preaching on is what they really need. But I'm not insecure about this at all, because I know from God's Word that this is uh, even what Jesus calls the most important thing, uh, what you must obey concerning God's Word. Mark chapter 12, picking up in verse 28. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Oh, and the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth. For there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But no one dared question him after that. Let's pray. Lord God, it is a privilege to open your word, to read your word, to hear your word. And it is our privilege and obligation to obey your word. So, would, Lord, would you teach us tonight? Teach us. Write it on our hearts. Teach us that we might uh, obey you and not sin against you, that we'd bring glory to you, even in, and it may be especially in this, the most important commandment tonight. And we pray it in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, there's an amazing occurrence going on in this setting, and it's not so much what is happening, but what's not happening. Because this occurrence is what's so normal in Israel to this day. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Israel and our work there. But, I mean, Israel is characterized by this. It's what makes the news. Jesus' ministry was characterized by this. It's kind of what makes things interesting a lot. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about conflict. There's an absence of conflict in this passage. There's a lot of love going around. The, the scribe asks Jesus a question. You know what he does that's very uncharacteristic of Jesus? He answers it. Take a look. When Jesus is asked a question, he rarely answers that question. Why? He asks a question back to check the motive and the wrong thinking of the questioner. It's also very rabbinic, and Jesus is a rabbi, and he's a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi of his time. 
He is theologically among the Pharisees, by the way. That's why he takes them on head to head all the time. Has no tolerance for his fellow errant uh, Pharisees. Uh, Paul was a Pharisee too, right? It's a party of a certain theological form that was uh, corrupted in many ways, but it wasn't like it was all wrong in its theology. Jesus is correcting it. He's challenging it. But meanwhile, he answers the scribe's question, which tells you what? It's a good question. Uh, by the way, speaking of the rabbis asking a question, there was a rabbi asked, he said, Rabbi, why do Jews always have to answer a question with a question? And the rabbi says, of course, so is it such a bad thing to answer a question with a question? <laughs> this love that's going around here, I, I really see love between the scribe in his right asking and Jesus in his right answering. And then the scribe affirming Jesus' answer and then Jesus telling him, you are close to the kingdom. It's reflective of the, the times they're in scripturally. The, the Old Testament is, is a book of love. It really is. You know, there's as many references to love in that book as there is in the New Testament. And in fact, many more references to the love of God in the Old Testament. Much more about the love of neighbor, each other in the New. I'm not saying they're not, you know, both, don't have both. They do, of course. But it's very interesting that Jesus attaches the two, doesn't he? Love God is utmost, and oh, the second is like it. Love your neighbor. And uh, I've shied away sometimes from talking much about love because I always thought I'd, I'm a low emotion kind of a guy. Anybody relate to me here? It helps me in texting to have those emojis now. I can add a little, little love emoji to my, to my text because otherwise I don't, I don't express my love very well. So I've shied away from love and expressions because I'm, I'm thinking of it as an emotion, as a feeling. Well, it's nice to have the feelings of emotion and emotions of love, but that's not what love is. Uh, love is obedience to God, and, it's, and it's, it's choosing Him first, and it's deferring to your neighbor first, and it's all part of the first commandment, and it's an act of the will that's wonderfully followed by emotion, which my wife supplies. I'm the low emotion. She's high emotion. We work together well. There's a there's a parallel passage that we won't turn to, but you can note that Matthew 22 and verse 33 and following has a similar scene going on. And Jesus adds these words at the end of it. All the law and the prophets hang on or depend upon these words. So again, he's definitely elevating this commandment as most important. Do you think that's fair to do with the scripture? I mean, there's 613 commandments, by the way, in the law. And, the, and they're basically asking, what's the most important? And uh, Jesus is answering directly, and he's saying, this is the most important. In fact, all the law and the prophets hang on these two. So we're definitely dealing with something very important here. And what, all I wanted to point out then, other than let's keep his word, let's, let's seek him to teach us uh, to, to love him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, and our neighbor like it, is that in the Mark passage, Mark was faithful to retain something that we often overlook. And it's what we read at the very beginning when he answers the question. The first of all the commandments, verse 29, is he doesn't tell you to love God right then. What does he tell you? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Do you know this is the confession called the Shema? The Shema is the Hebrew word that we're saying there. Hear. You can say that with me, Shema. Shema. And you could, it had the idea of, of hearing, listening. But, you know, just like a mother maybe would say to her kids, you know, you boys go clean up that room. And a little while later, she just hears them roughhousing in there. Mayhem is going on. And she says, did you hear me? What is she saying? Did you obey me? Not just like, did you hear the sound of my voice? Or are you listening to me? It's, are you obeying me? And that's exactly the weight of the word here in the Hebrew. He Hebrew is not a conceptual language. It's an action language. And the Jewish people, as I work among them, the Israelis, as I work among them, they're looking for action. It's right there in James. His name was really Yaakov or Jacob and later got named James. But he says it in there. He says, you say you have faith? Show me. I've always thought he's from Missouri, the show me state. That's so Jewish. Just like answering a question with a question. Same idea. You say you have faith? Show me. And so that's how our ministry is, it's formed around the idea of loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. And sometimes your neighbor actually turns out to be your enemy. And when I was early into 
this work of, as a pastor in upstate New York in the mid-90s of, of exploring this, this seeming calling that was going on. It's like, why am I being called into the Jewish community? Why am I heading off to Israel? And I'm starting to work with this ministry that's been there already then several decades, now 50-something years. Why? God, the Jews are hard to work with. In fact, a friend came to me and said, I don't even know why you're being kind to the Jews. They're your enemy. He was a very pragmatic type. But he, I said, what? Glenn was his name. Glenn, what are you talking about? I, I, he said, it's right in the scripture. Paul said it. Where? Romans 11. And I think, wait a minute. Romans 11 is all, like, all about helping us understand the calling of the church to the Jews and the, and the ongoing plan and purpose of God for Israel. Uh, so what's he talking about? I was not schooled enough, even though I was a seminary grad and pastor. I, didn't, I wasn't ready with an answer. But in that passage in Romans 11, it says, they, referring to the Jews, are your enemy, he was right, for the sake of the gospel. What that means is, fundamentally, other than the plenty of Jews who were believing the gospel and making disciples and carrying the gospel to the nations, turning the world upside down, those were all Jews, now Jews are mostly not believing. They're even opposing your message. And, and that's mostly been the story since then, that opposition of the Jews to the message of the gospel. So Glenn concludes, they're your enemy, like the scripture says. You, why would you have anything to do with them? Well, what two points is he missing? One is the rest of the verse. He gave me half of the verse. The rest of the verse says, but for the, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Always. Always, for the sake of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that means the covenant that God established with Abraham. And God's a covenant maker and a covenant keeper. He calls it a Brit Olam, an everlasting covenant. And, and it holds, it runs. And so they oppose your gospel, thereby your enemy. But always and still, and remember, don't forget, beloved, for the sake of the Father, they are my beloved enemy. And what did Jesus teach us anyway about our enemy? Love your enemy. And you know, if you ever want to get tested in this first commandment, it's not too hard, you know, when it's a loving, easy to talk to person, like Pastor Stewart over dinner. What a loving man. I wasn't tested in my love there. You, did, you, didn't, you made it easy on me. But I've, you've been with some people. Maybe they're seated near you. Maybe they're in your household sometimes. An enemy doesn't have to be some uh, theoretical danger afar off like ISIS, who if they got their hands on you, might, might cut your head off. An enemy is one who's opposing you, one who is resisting. And I need my wife's resistance and opposition sometimes to set me straight, and I resent it until I remember the first commandment, and I remember how she's a gift to me. And I start repenting before the Lord and to her, and I say, I need your opposition sometimes, don't I? Husbands, remember that. Say, wives, you don't, don't remember that. But, all right. So, let me translate it now to this. Learning to love my enemy has become very important in my life. I don't really identify people as my enemy. I just re realize there's some people oppose me. They resist me. What an opportunity to love them. But particularly among the Jews, beloved for the sake of the Father. So, Let's go by video very quickly to taking a quick glimpse at, at, at Christians in action in Israel, responding this way, getting a calling to, to demonstrate the love of Jesus for the ancient covenanted people, that though they were scattered over the whole globe, as God said he would, he also said he would regather them. The prophets speak of this over and over again, it's happening in our time, the last hundred plus years, the mid-1800s began to see a significant shift of the Jews from all over the globe back to the land of Israel. Some people love it, some people hate it. It's never going to be an easy ride when you talk about God's plan for the land and the people. These are seeming, these are controversial issues by nature, but God has called his church to humble herself and serve in agreement with his word. And, and that, I mentioned prophecy, Bible prophecy. The one thing about Bridges for Peace is we don't major on future predictive prophecy. You might really enjoy that. I don't know if, if that's an interest to you, but have you ever noticed how much the body of Christ splits and divides over that? This is interesting that we've learned from the rabbis, from our association 
with, uh, with Jewish scholarship, uh, they don't use prophecy for future prediction. Did you know that? That's not what prophecy is for. Prophecy is to know. To know so that when it comes to pass, you can say this is that which the prophet spoke. You'll see it in Acts chapter 2. Peter stands up and the people are going, what is this? Because there's a mighty powerful move of the Holy Spirit that's bringing forth the church, all Jewish at this point, maybe a, a roaming Gentile in there. It's a Jewish church. It's coming forth, Acts chapter 2, and they say, what is it? And he says, this is that which the prophet Joel spoke. You see, and that's, that's classic. That's it. That's, that's Hebraic Jewish understanding of prophecy. We have studied the prophets so that when it comes to pass. So the question to you and me is, is this regathering of the Jews to the land now that which the prophets spoke? Well, I'm standing before you because I've come to the conclusion over and over from God's word and then observing the fulfillment that, yes, this is it. So we provide tons of food uh, daily to help the, the needy, particularly those that are just arriving from often very poor, two suitcases in hand. They come with next to nothing. We're helping. Repairing homes, providing uh, kitchen sets and other welcome gifts, uh, helping directly 63,000 now, those that are coming from distant lands, you know, to leave the former Soviet Union, let's say, and to make it home to Israel. They've never lived there before, but it's home. They're returning to their homeland. This is a phenomenon that's happening. It it's continues. There's been times where there's big uh, rushes, but, there, and there, but there's a steady flow all the time to the point that the number one immigrant destination per capita is, is Israel, the state of Israel, absorbing more immigrants. Uh, than, and a lot of refugees, too, from other nations at the same time. Tiny land the size of New Jersey absorbing and uh, constantly on a, on a war footing, defense uh, having to be established against uh, many enemies and enemies within that are jihadist elements. The very thing that we work hard to root up or keep out of our nation, it's integrated into their nation. They have to manage it all the time. So that's Israel. So they could use a hand. They could use help. God has called his church into it. That's what we do. So the video I wanted to show you first is, is a little idea of Bible prophecy being fulfilled. And you'll see it's, it's current. It's not a concern about, oh, how do we figure out the future? So please roll that for me, if you would. When you hear Bible prophecy, what's the first thing that comes to mind? I used to hear those words and think about something in the future or something God was doing that I had no part in. Here's the thing. For the Jewish people, Bible prophecy isn't just a list of what will happen. It's a to-do list for the now. They look at it and ask, how can I become an active part of this? And I think Christians should do the same. Let me give you an example. In Ezekiel 36, 8, we read, But you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. This prophecy promises the return of the Jewish people in conjunction with fruitfulness and growth within the physical land of Israel. Recently, we at Bridges for Peace had a chance to plant trees in a part of Israel that used to be only wilderness. We were joining in that Ezekiel 36 prophecy answering the invitation to come alongside the Jewish people in this exciting time. And here's the wonderful thing. You can be a part of Bible prophecy too. When you join as a volunteer, learning and teaching about the land of Israel, or giving financially, you are taking an active role in what the Lord is doing. So come, walk with us, and be His hands and feet here in the land to the Jewish people. bit of a recruiting video to say, come join us and work in the land of Israel. And I do want to encourage you to come to the land of Israel. How many have, uh, have been there before? Anybody here with us? Uh huh. And look, they're alive to tell you about it. They've come back. Most people do return alive and well and, and, uh, and very uh, thrilled with what they've seen in the land of the Bible. The magazine that I've given you, the Dispatch from Jerusalem, is our special edition. I wonder, I know a helper was handing them out. Do you think everybody might have gotten one or couples? Uh, just want you to note that, um, you know, this is what we publish uh, for every, every two months, so bi-monthly. And um, it started out as a one-page mimeograph. Now, who remembers the mimeograph here? You're going to date yourself. Uh-oh, yeah. Yeah, we're dating ourselves. Used to crank out the mimeograph. A younger generation is looking at us like, what? what are, who are you people? But Dr. G. Douglas Young 
established the scholarship of this work back in the 50s and really started the work of Bridges for Peace then in the 60s when he went to found the uh, Institute of uh, uh, yeah the Institute of uh, Israel Studies in um, on Mount Zion and he was realizing wow not everybody's coming to study here I better start putting out some information started sending his dispatch a one page mimeograph and that has grown into the full color bi-monthly um, if you wanted to connect to this work, and I do encourage you to connect to Israel some way, I encourage you to have a, a vital connection somehow to what God is doing. It's not just like a, a thing that's happening, it's not uh, political, uh, it, it's like God is actually doing what we just read. Um, we'll take some questions in a moment, and maybe if you feel differently, I'm happy to see if we can, if we can uh, discuss the issues. But if God is doing this, uh, I suggest being connected to it. So you know how to pray? And, uh, and you might know how to, uh, to go to be a part of things or right here locally, you know, help us just spread the word on what God is doing. Tell your friend, tell your neighbor, take an extra magazine off the table. That's what a friend did for, uh, for us. Uh, a friend reunited my, with my wife after 20 years of being totally different places after high school. They run into each other and, sh and they find out they both have a heart for Jesus now and they have a heart for Israel now. And then the friend says to her, have you heard of Bridges for Peace? And of course she said, no, because you've never heard of Bridges for Peace. We don't advertise. Well, she was carrying her dispatch from Jerusalem. She gave it to my wife, brought it home. And me, the pastor, started looking through and saying, that's cool. I like archaeology. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing what's going on with the Jews back in Israel and all this technology and world-changing stuff is going on. And there's always the conflict. Yeah, wow, what's going on there? Let me try to get an understanding of what the real security issues are. But as when I got to the back, that's what God used to grab my little heart and start generating that first commandment of loving my neighbor this way. Even if they opposed my gospel, what if I served them and loved them? The projects are listed here. There's some main ones listed, but there's 20 something and they can all, you know, any of them can be designated in somebody's giving. That's what grabbed my heart because God had already stirred up in my heart that I need a response to what he's doing in the return to Zion. And I found out I was just joining a part of flow of history where God has had his church for many centuries, ever really since the Bible came into people's hands through the Reformation time and all. They started to look at the prophets and say, wow, you know, well before it's happening, they're saying he's going to do it. He's going to regather the Jews to the land. And now we have really no excuse as far as I'm concerned because it's happening in full force. And now it's shifted to where over half of the populations of the world Jews are, are in Israel. That's is only 14 million people, the total population, right? About seven of them, seven plus in the land of Israel today. So God was stirring me up to connect me to how I could pray, how I could give, and then how I could go. And I've gone many times and uh, now ended up working to, uh, to help bring this understanding across the United States. And, uh, and connect the U.S. as well as the church generally to Israel. Um, why don't I open up for a few questions here? You might say, well, what is this really all about? Or what is God's word on the matter? Or uh, would love to know more of this or that. Uh, be happy to see if we can do that. And we'll be sure to close with the word and prayer too. Uh, and I think we're going to do that at, uh, at about 7. So we have 15 minutes. If anyone has a question, would you just raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. I was wondering about the archaeological aspect of it. How is, the, um, how is this organization ministering to the Jewish people as they go about discovering these ruins and stuff? I mean, is there a way that you can reach out to them through that? Or are any of oh. your people working on the archaeological sites and stuff like that? Well, anybody can get involved in a dig. You just get associated with, start searching online for, you know, who's, who's got archaeological work going on. And you can go over there and just connect with them and, uh, and be trained on how to be a worker on a dig. Now, that's nothing that we do as a project. It just means that we might help connect you and facilitate. What we do, everything we do is relational. And that's, uh, a pastor mentioned our, our mission statement is building relationships between Christians and Jews. And that, there's an innov innovative way to do it. You, you, maybe you have a, a great interest and love for the idea of, of uh, digging in the dirt. And finding what's there will then go be part of a, of a dig. 
And, um, and other ways, for instance, a, a, just a kind of a parallel, a project we have is a home repair, getting your hands dirty. Uh, we've repaired over 1,300 homes. This, this takes a guy like you or a gal like you who says, gee, I don't feel like a, I'm a qualified you know, theologian, missionary, whatever. That's great. How about if you have some home repair skills? You know, I've served on home repair teams, and I have no home repair skills even, but I was the cleanup guy. They love it. These skilled people love it to have a guy like me that'll clean up after them. And they make a mess, don't they? They do good work. Um, so, yeah, please. Uh, this morning we were studying Jeremiah 33, and uh, there, as all throughout the prophets, God is promising to bring back together Israel and Judah. Now, in this country, that's, uh, you should know, you probably know that in other countries it's different. In this country, people make uh, the word Jew and the word Israel synonyms, like it is the only thing. But in this, throughout the scripture, Israel is one thing, the 12 tribes that disappear in history, and Judah and Benjamin are the, the Judah. How do you see that? Yes, good question. The 10 tribes of the north were, were lost in the Assyrian uh, conquering. And then the tribe of Judah and Benjamin in the south were taken captive to Babylon, and a remnant returned, and all that was prophesied. And then God talks about a second return, and on and on. And this is what, I'm, what we're seeing. But he's making a distinction, rightly, between who we call the Jews. That name comes from Judah. Now, long ago, that name got applied broadly to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to the keepers of the law, to the, to the ones, whether they were natural born or they were converted in. Uh, Jews. So that term is used broadly. Technically, we would identify, if we could, and it's hard over centuries to make a d complete distinction between who's of the tribes of Israel, the ten lost, and who are Judah. But the ten lost tribes are being found now. The Falashimura of, of Ethiopia have yeah. been returning now for two decades, three decades, to Israel. Uh, the uh, the Bnei Manasseh, the sons of Manasseh, the tribe of Manasseh, that's there in northeast India. And then there's research going on, and there's debate, but, uh, you know, Israel is debating it more than anybody. Are these the tribes? But the tribes are being found. And so I would just tell you, broadly, you can say the Jews. Technically, that means the Judeans. And then there's the other tribes of Israel. And you wouldn't call them Jews technically, but time has changed such that that's just a, a broad use title now. A Jew is a pract one who practices uh, Judaism or identifies with the heritage of the Jewish people. Thank you. Another question. I'm going to go to Kathleen and Peter. And then Lloyd. I just wanted to know if you are Jewish. And if you are, how did you find Christ? Oh, thanks. I am a plain old Gentile, but I believe uh, I can say with the heart of a Jew, and I believe you too if you've received Jesus into your heart. You do have the Jewish Messiah living in you. Um, in another dimension, that heart of a Jew could mean just called to and caring, actually loving uh, this people. Particularly in light of history, there's a terrible history between Christian and Jew. Uh, when they hear Christian, especially the ones of other lands that are coming into Israel, because it's been a little different, better experience in America, but other lands, it's mostly they still view Christians as their persecutor, the ones who despise them for rejecting Jesus. So we're painting a new story. We love you no matter what, but let us show you and demonstrate his love and ask your questions, which they do, and that leads to the knowledge of Jesus. Now, in my own case, just a, a non-Jewish guy who in the word of God saw God's ongoing plan for this people and was called into it and, and encouraging others to, uh, to see how God might uh, use you at least to pray, maybe to go, maybe to give and tell others. So I'm a Gentile on a mission. Super. Yeah. Peter? Uh, currently in Israel, how many percent of the population is Christian? And years ago, there were a group of uh, Jews for Jesus came to talk to us 
And while they were they related, they are not necessarily persecuted, but they are pretty much uh, kind of frowned upon by their own uh, family and uh, and friends. And yeah. so, how how how's the current situation? Mm, yes, good question and broad. Let me try to narrow it down. Um, nobody knows the percentage of believers in Jesus. And when you say Christian, we can also kind of like your question, brother. We can make a distinction. Uh, Christians, there's, there's, there's many types of Christians. Of every possible type of Christianity is in Israel because Israel is a, is a, is a you know, guards freedom of worship and safeguards every Christian denomination. Uh, there's, a, there's an amazing number of the, the sects, the, 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 uh, the orthodoxies. So, and, and then there's Arab Christians who are not Jews. And then there's Jews who are believers in Jesus. And you could call them Christians, but they use the title Messianic Jew, right? So it's a crazy mixed up world. We all just sort of have our identifiers. But maybe 1%, it's something probably less than 1% of the Jews would be believers in Jesus. That would be about maybe 15,000, maybe 20,000 uh, Jews in the land of Israel believing in Jesus. Several hundred congregations, some as small as, you know, a home gathering, two full, you know, church-like synagogue, you know, messianic synagogue. It's a growing phenomenon. It's, that's not a big number, but it's growing steadily. And no Jewish congregations at all, zero, were, were noted before 1967, which was a, a year of huge change because Jerusalem was reunited that year. And again, people have loved or hated that ever since. And we're just about to see the next installment on that as an issue because we're putting our embassy into uh, the disputed capital of Jerusalem now, next month. That got off, off your question, but maybe that was kind of giving you an idea. Relatively small number growing, though. Next question. Uh, I, having the privilege to, get to go, go to Israel a few years ago and getting very interested in having a lot of time on my hands since I retired, I uh, got to love to watch all the, the preachers on TV, uh, Charles Stanley, David Jeremiah, and different ones. And by luck, I ran into Jews for Jesus. And I, by that, I found out that there's a, uh, every evening at 5 o'clock on channel 366 and direct TV, you can get news right out of Israel. Uh -huh. And I, every day I listen to the news five days a week out of Israel. And by that also, I got, found other stations there that were doing programs on Israel and stuff. And they were showing the diggings where they're finding, where they're finding old buildings and stuff, down foundations and stuff. And you know what? If, if people want to see it, Go to get on Direct TV if you've got it, and go to channel 366, and it'll lead you to it. All right, thank you. Uh, well, uh, just let me explain. Hmm? This guy is a subcontractor for Direct TV. <laughs> <laughs> He'll sign you. Any up. other? One last question. And I'll add, provide your email on our connection card out there. It looks like this on the table. If you'd like to be directly connected, it was another commercial moment, don't, don't you think? Uh, you would receive the magazine, the teaching letter, and uh, the email would come every week with an update, a prayer update, news and how to pray every week in your in inbox. Yes, sir. Yeah, my understanding of your ministries is by showing love and compassion to the Jewish people, you're building a bridge yes. of communication. But is it not illegal to proselytize in Israel? That's exactly why we're doing what we're doing. Pro proselytizing is illegal if there's any form of coercion attached to it. Uh, the Jews from their history and in relation to us are hypersensitive about conversionary efforts. But they safeguard freedom of religion, including preaching the gospel. But, so here's what it comes down to. You can't combine a gift with a conversionary attempt. We give tons of gifts. Now, we decided to do that a long time ago. Because serving and giving and just, just loving your neighbor as yourself builds something. And while it also breaks down a barrier and it heals hearts and it opens pathways... Now, they ask their questions, and as we answer their questions, it's never proselytizing. So we can do both. We can give the gift, and we can answer their question, thereby preaching the gospel. Does that make some sense? And just to clarify the laws, anybody 18 and younger, that's illegal. You can't, you can't hand them a tract. I mean, I don't know anybody's going to rush up and arrest you. But we've got a Christian witness to maintain, so we're not going to hand them the tract. 
We're going to trust God to, to, you know, bring them to him as we pray. And we're going to abide by the laws of the land so that we're a good neighbor there. And we serve all kinds of needs. And they get to ask their questions, and that's never prostituting. So youth are, are, you know, minors are protected from any conversionary effort because it's assumed that they can't make necessarily an informed decision. And then uh, everybody's protected from coercionary efforts, like combining a gift. Our, our tons of food that go out, a bag of food to somebody, if we slipped a tract in there, yes, that's against the law. Does that make sense? You're combining a conversionary effort with a gift. Okay. Uh, time for another question. And a last video, too. I just got a short one for you. So, Is, is there another question? Just be... I just wanted to ask, how many visits have you or you and your family made? Yeah, well, I've been there 21 times uh, since 98. And that's, you know, that's kind of a lot of times. But then I'm working among people who you know, have been there over 100 times and, have, and people who have lived and served in Israel for decades. So I'm still a novice. There's so much to learn in the land. My family, my wife has been there eight times as we've hosted tours together, and uh, that's a great joy. And all of our kids, uh, minus one, has so far, has made it to the land of Israel. Let me just take you by video there, just it's very brief, showing you the, the, the essence then of what uh, he's called Christians to do, and we as Bridges, as an organization, uh, get to walk that out. Bridges for Peace, Christians supporting Israel and building relationships between Christians and Jews in Israel and around the world. Bridges for Peace, 50 years of blessing Israel and the Church through compassion and revelation. Compassion, feeding Israel's hungry, caring for Israel's needy, repairing homes, giving hope to children in poverty, helping the Jewish people return to their ancient homeland, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Revelation, bringing the Bible to life in its ancient context, revealing the truth of Israel's prophetic significance, telling the story of Israel's miraculous rebirth, connecting Christians and the Jewish people through a grassroots global team of Christian representatives. For God's instruction shall go forth from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Bridges for Peace, a Matthew 25 ministry dedicated to supporting the nation of Israel and bridging the centuries-old gap between Christians and Jews. Bridges for Peace, your Israel connection. Cheryl, who just narrated that, mentioned a Matthew 25 ministry. You might recall in Matthew 25, uh, Jesus explains that the, uh, the Son of Man will come and the nations will be brought before him and he'll separate them as the sheep and the goats. And what separates them? I don't think it's a salvational uh, issue that's going on here because it's works. They're, it's, they're presenting their works. Did they do this? Did they do that? You know, did they clothe him? Did they uh, feed him? Did they visit him in prison? Turns out that it's him. Whatever they've done, he says, for the least of these. Now he's in Jerusalem. I'm picturing him referring to those around him. And whatever you've done, you've done for the least of these, he says, my brethren. And you know, in missions and in work of compassion among the poor all over the world, we've applied that. Most any compassion ministry should apply that everywhere, and, and so be it. It's just that we might have forgotten the first context. Jesus in Jerusalem among his brethren, the Jews, saying, whatever you've done for the least of these... And imagine, in this time, he's actually given us the opportunity to even fulfill that. Even that. The least of these, his brethren after the flesh, is the implication. That family. You've done it for me, he says. So, Lord God, we uh, ask that you might help us to ponder these thoughts and, and respond to your heart and to be obedient and faithful. To love you, mighty God, teach us to love you with our whole heart, our whole soul, our whole mind, our understanding, and our, and our whole strength. And then to love our neighbor, even as ourself. And Lord, when our neighbor turns out to be the difficult one, the challenging one, teach us how to go beyond ourself and to sacrifice and love and serve. And thank you for the privilege of what I've gotten to testify to of how uh, that is, does have an outworking right now as we speak.
in the land of Israel. So we give you the glory for the great things you have done and will do. And I thank you personally again for the privilege of being among uh, this precious uh, uh, body of Christ, your body here tonight, assembled in your name, opening your word. Again, wanting to go out and uh, give you the glory in all things that you lead us to do on your behalf. For we all pray together in that matchless name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.